Fifteen years, of course, is uh, always the opportunity, the chance for people to come back into the road. There's, there's to be um, dependent on causes and conditions. So, one of the important causes and conditions would be for that person to take, you know, an interest, a continuing interest in the Dhamma practice, and ideally, you know, remain single. Not too many commitments and. Uh, responsibilities so that one is in a position that when the mind is ready that one could come back into the road and then to keep up the practice you need to develop a lot of contemplation of death and just the nature of life in the world how it's very impermanent unsatisfactory that all the wealth that we accumulate the experiences the pleasures of the world don't really last they don't really satisfy us or bring us to the end of suffering. Just keep contemplating that and little by little one's mindfulness will turn into samadhi and from that some insight will arise. And when that's mature to the point you know, that you feel you're getting some, some real peace from that contemplation, and the mind will be ready to, to leave behind the world again and come back into the road. He said, when you first ordain, you tend to do it with a rush of inspiration, faith, enthusiasm, and you know, that doesn't sustain, that doesn't last. What sustains one in the robes has to be more continuous mindfulness practice, and then contemplating the Dhamma, as he just described, contemplating the impermanent nature of this body, this mind, and the things of the world. And when one has some regular mindfulness practice, that will start to emerge into samadhi, and that's what will really keep one in the road for longer, not just bursts of inspiration and, and sort of just faith. A lot of my family, they're encouraging me, oh, you're back, and you know, family, business, and all this. And, uh, <laughs> no, 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 you know, so I, so there's that pressure and getting, it's also stirring up a lot of, you know, oh yeah, cool, but, um, it's hard and I, I really, sort of, I just want to ask in that world, and, uh, that, do I contemplate death to kind of that, or do we, or, He says, yes, of course, there is this sense of struggle between the Dhamma and the world, or the worldly Dhammas, and then the transcendental Dhammas. And you might say at the moment, the strength of your Dhamma practice and the various spiritual faculties and qualities uh, that uh, support the Dhamma practice are not quite enough to bring you back into the roads. But that doesn't mean to say you, you know, you can't practice or you stop practicing. One can still practice quite, um, well as a lay person. And so one carries on. If you have a job, you know, you need to get a job and work and do various activities that lay people do. Well, that's fine. But try to maintain this, uh, regular reflection on these truths, these deeper truths to keep the goal, the highest goal in mind. You know, when you are making money to realize, well, this isn't going to lead to ultimate happiness. This is still very temporary happiness, money and what it can bring in worldly wealth and happiness of families, relationships and so on. You keep bringing your mind back to the higher goal and, you know, keep, when you can, you put effort into your practice, develop meditation, contemplate the Dhamma, hear the Dhamma. Even take time out, like now, say, to come and stay in the monastery, keep the eight precepts uh, from time to time. And what you're doing is you're still practicing the Buddhist path and you're developing you know, one aspect of the Buddha, Buddhist uh, community as well as Buddhist lay people, men and women who are devoted to the practice but they still have worldly responsibilities. So you can do that, you can practice as a good lay person and keep developing that. And you know, the religion needs that as well, you know, monks are supported by lay people, it's not that everyone becomes a monk. But if you keep up a regular practice and you keep deepening your insight, well you might 
later in life when the time is right you might reach a point where you feel uh, enough of this worldly um, pursuit of worldly happiness and uh, the more worldly sort of activities enough of that now I'm ready to go back to the roads and you might have some insight at that point and you know just, it'll just turn your mind meaning your faculties your inner qualities have reached the point where they are getting stronger and they're stronger to overcome the various defilements and attachments that previously held you at back from joining the roads or going into the roads Christian I want to ask uh, um one problem I have is sleeping. I've been sleeping, waking up in the middle of the night and my mind starts working and ticking over and I find it hard to keep my mind still and I'll, to get back to sleep. And I'm wondering if the, the techniques of meditation that we use to keep to still our mind in meditation are appropriate to, to still my mind at night to get back to sleep or whether a, a different technique or approach Yes, of course, you can uh, meditate at that time. Uh, he recommends to contemplate, develop some insight, say if you're thinking about work and other sort of more mundane responsibilities at that time, um, bring your mind to contemplate impermanence, the impermanence of your very life as a human being, the fact that we uh, all, our, all of our lives come to an end, we get old, we get sick, we die. Uh, the things that we achieve in this world, the wealth that we build up, the, all the sort of different experiences we have are all ultimately impermanent. Uh, changing experiences, changing phenomena. Um, contemplate that until it brings your mind to sort of release the energy and the uh, whatever you're grasping at that's keeping you sort of thinking about those uh, worldly things uh, and just the mind lets go uh, at that point you might fall asleep because you've sort of just let go of whatever it is you've been thinking about or at that point then just turn to uh, the meditation object you're more used to familiar with maybe the breathing meditation counting the breath or any other meditation technique that you use uh, he suggested another one is contemplation of the body to see that the body is made up of four elements earth, air, fire, water and the, developing the perception of non-self in this body seeing it as just as elements um, what you'll find is if you're developing any kind of meditation technique whichever one it is you know, when you get to the point where you lose your mindfulness your concentration of that meditation technique well then you'll just fall asleep naturally because you've lost your mindfulness your mind mm. will drift off to sleep uh, which is okay, you yeah, that's, know, that's fine. And I suppose part of that is if, if you're worrying about something in particular, if you're contemplating impermanence, our worries are impermanent too, but they will eventually right. go and disappear. Generally, what feeds our worries and any kind of mental agitation and suffering is this grasping grasping at our, our experience, grasping at the thoughts, grasping at the objects, the things you're thinking about, the concepts, the uh, issues. Uh, so when you contemplate impermanence, what it's doing is helping your mind to accept the very thing that's feeding your, your worry and, 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 and that you're worrying about is impermanent. Your, your mind, over time, contemplating impermanence, starts to accept this thing is impermanent. The worries are impermanent, the thoughts are impermanent, it starts to let go then. That's why we experience more peace, a sense of release. As long as we don't contemplate, the mind will just keep grasping, attaching to the issue, keep feeling, thinking it over, and we suffer. And Buddha always said attachment leads to suffering. It's a kind of a basic process of the mind that you can't avoid. As long as there's attachment there, you'll suffer, end up suffering. But the uh, reflection on impermanence is what helps remedy, you see through attachment, remedies that and your mind will start to let go, experience release. We have to reflect that although we have our worldly responsibilities, our duties to family, to work, to society and so on, 
unfortunately it's the nature of human existence that we are bound by aging, sickness and death and so they compare this to like a sort of creeping fire that's gradually coming nearer and gradually incinerating us little by little, burning us up little by little and you know when we're younger we don't recognize that fact often we, we're oblivious to it but as we get older you know, perhaps it does become more obvious that time is running out little by little. It's all sort of being burnt up, being incinerated. So that's the reflection that leads you to want to do something more, to, to follow, pursue the spiritual practice. When you start to pursue the spiritual practice more earnestly, perhaps more sincerely, it's important to reflect this is not turning your back on your worldly responsibilities, responsibility to your family, to society and so on. What you're doing is developing yourself so that you have skills and strengths and goodness of heart that you can then turn around and take that back to help your family, society and so on. So it's just recognizing the fact before you can really fulfill and really help others properly, you also have to help yourself. So this is how the, the spiritual, the Buddhist path works. It's not turning one completely turning one's back on family and society and so on. It's merely seeing the importance of uh, developing some of these higher truths, higher dhammas for oneself, and then that becomes the goodness that you can take back to help help uh, the world. There's the most important thing if one still has aspiration, aspiration to uh, enter the monkhood again is to minimize one's fetters, ties, burdens in, in the worldly life. Um, is it, you know, the comparison is like if you have uh, a job and you know it, you start to take on responsibility in that job, you commit to it to the point where you become really tied up with it, well it's like your hand is tied to something, and your hand's tied. The wealth that you develop uh, and gain from that job, your property, money, other things, like your foot becomes tied. And probably strongest of all if you have a partner, a wife, and maybe children later, it's like your, your neck, your throat is tied. So you're completely bound up, bound down, very difficult to, you know, extract yourself from all those ties. Um, one, so one should reflect maybe that the monk's life is the most convenient, suitable life for practicing Dhamma, for developing meditation, contemplating to develop insight. Uh, that's how this lifestyle emerged, it's for, for that very reason. So it is the most ideal form, suitable form. <coughs> So if one has that aspiration and recognizes that well to try and keep one's options open by limiting the ties to the world, you know, family, wealth, responsibility, to limit that so that there is more of a chance that one can step out when the mind is ready, one can step out from it. And it's essential to maintain the, the level of one's faith commitment to the teachings, to the Buddhist path. So you come out of the robes, or you, to be in the robe, you've had quite a firm, quite a high level of, of faith commitment. And the important thing is obviously to try not to let that wane and disappear, or fade. Um, because obviously there's a lot of temptation and uh, opportunity for distraction and getting lost in, in worldly moods and worldly experiences. Everything we experience through our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, touch with the body and then just the uh, all the ideas and concepts popping up in the mind, that's chipping away or eroding away against your faith if, if you don't have enough mindfulness and enough strength to contemplate these things or they'll little, little by little chip away at your, your faith, your commitment to the practice. So that's the, the tricky part is to keep 
you could say, reaffirming and re-establishing and maintaining faith and confidence and commitment to the practice. So we do that by you know, continuing to uh, listen to Dhamma, read Dhamma, meet with teachers, uh, come to the monasteries, go on retreats, all these sort of things help to keep up our faith, the level of our faith. And you know, some kind of regular Dhamma practice in your daily life say, in the evenings and when you come home from work, not just to let off steam with many kind of worldly things, worldly pursuits, but to always reflect, well, what's the highest happiness for me and the highest happiness in the world? Well, it's Nibbāna. You know, Nibbāna is the complete ending of suffering through the uh, eradication of kilesa and defilement. That's even more profound, deeper kind of happiness than you can experience, say, in the heaven realms or the Brahma realms, and certainly in this world. So you have that goal then to you know, put some effort into maintaining mindfulness practice, both in daily life, but also you know, practice a regular meditation technique, so that you have some strength of mindfulness to uh, counter that temptation to get lost in all the, the sense distraction of the world that it brings to us. And if you keep practicing mindfulness regularly like this, well, little by little your mind becomes fir firmer, you become more experienced in the practice, you start to experience some samadhi, some, some real um, contentment and peace of heart. And that will, you know, that's the real sort of supportive condition that will both keep your faith going because you can see the very results of your practice but it also may be bringing you back to the roads. Yes, it's a very powerful auspicious chant to do. Uh, when one's chanting, you know, with, with faith and mindfulness in the chant, you'll find that actually you get this sense of the energy, the body uh, coming up as if there's an energy coming to protect one. The different important points, uh, energy points of this body and mind, as one's chanting, they come. That energy comes comes to protect one. So one has a very sort of sense of solidity and 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 peace of mind comes through that. The important thing is obviously to uh, maintain and develop mindfulness as one chants, recollect what one's doing, have presence of mind, and then recollect the qualities of Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. Uh, this is what brings up this energy, you know, the, the sort of goodness of the mind, bringing the mind up, bringing the level of rapture and happiness up during that chant. And how much energy, how much sort of strength of mind one gets from that, well, it depends on one's own merit and uh, practice, you know, how deeply, how sincerely one does it and how much, how often one does it and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, this one, the chant for the medicine Buddha, uh, doesn't it work in medicine? Tibetan style? Yeah. It's a, yes, it's a form of Buddha Anusati, recollecting the Buddha, uh, so it can be a kind of barikama, chanting, uh, any kind of chant dedicated to that, the medicine Buddha, or recollecting the qualities of the Buddha. Um, often it's done with the aim to literally to help eradicate illness, but how much that can <coughs> really happen partly depends on you know the state of one's health, how severe such an illness is, you know, if it's a severe illness maybe it can't be eradicated. Um, but what one is doing is bringing up very wholesome dhammas, mindfulness, faith, energy and effort, and from that one can also gain insight. And yeah, any recollection of the Buddha is again bringing us to develop insight into an Ichadukha Anatta that will bring us the mind to let go of its attachments and reach Nibbāna little by little. Um, and one of the ways they describe Nibbāna is you know, a state that is free from roka. Roka means illness or disease, uh, literally mental illness as in greed, anger and delusion have, have been abandoned. So the mind is free. So 
you know, you get you get to the end of your illness anyway, your physical illness as well. There's nibbana, you know. There's no more attachment, no more birth, so there's no more illness. Question about uh, the value of chanting. Uh, so why like to chant? Um, chant they do in Thai. Your program, but I don't. I don't know what it's called in English. You know, can we? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's a famous one that ties to, it incorporates uh, reflections on Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha and some other teachings. And uh, the Ajahn said the main purpose of that chant and any other chanting is the function of chanting helps you to focus your mind on Dhamma with mindfulness. So it's a training in mindfulness, but also you're focusing on very wholesome subject matter which can stimulate your contemplation to develop insight as well and then also so I mentioned that uh, is it good to spread metta or do a chant for spreading thoughts of loving kindness metta as you do your evening chanting say and he said yes very good to help counter our tendency towards aversion um, and bring up very wholesome state of mind, very pure state of mind as we do that chant. Um, and then so, so I mentioned that, well, perhaps sometimes we get, you know, you chant often, regularly, the same sort of chants. There'll be some periods where you feel bored or unenthusiastic for the chant. And uh, to mention, I said, well, that's part of the challenge and part of the purpose of the chant, regular chanting, is at those times is to bring up one's effort. One has to put a bit more effort in, try to aim to use the chant to overcome that more negative uh, mood by focusing on the Dhamma with mindfulness to see if one can bring the mind to a wholesome, peaceful, happy state during the chant to the point where it can let go of its, its negative mood. Obviously in the course of our daily life there will be events and things and just getting tired say that, that causes us to feel uh, a loss of mental energy and the mind falls into more unwholesome negative states of mind so you can use chanting in, in this way to bring the mind back up uh, to focus on something very wholesome and use it as a, as a skillful means in that way just one thing I have uh, what is I'm not used to receiving guests so sometimes I go for what to talk about or how to get a focus. I just pick a few books or whatnot that are suitable for lay people just to maybe for five minutes read something just to give an give a atmosphere to the environment. So I feel I'm in the shadow of these great teachers. We love to support the great teachers. Such as yourself and other great efforts and leaders of monasteries. So, uh, does he feel this is inappropriate to show the, the, the amateur or <laughs> I'm a downfall because of my own? It's fine to use a book, you know, to read a book, dumb a book, and to stimulate discussion or, like you say, set an atmosphere. It's dhamma dharma, it's giving the dhamma as dharma. And both they gain from it and you gain from it as well. So everyone gains. Mm. And to understand that in terms of teaching, receiving guests, teaching, giving dhamma teachings and so on, this is a, just like meditation or any other aspect of the life, it's something that grows with experience. Mm -hmm. So when we begin, of course, we feel a little bit of not sure what to say and, that, and that's just because we haven't done it very much. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, keep doing it, like any other practice, you'll get more skilled at it, you'll... Uh, the, your experience will help lead you into what you have to say and how to deal with people and, and give them some dhamma. And just to keep focus on the fact that it's all very wholesome what you're doing. You're giving them some uh, guidance, some inspiration, guidance, advice in the dhamma practice. Mm. Uh, and you yourself can also benefit from it by contemplating the teachings as you're doing that. Mm. And just to see it in that way, it's something very wholesome. There's a question about uh, the state of mind when we die, like in the case of somebody who's maybe unconscious from a stroke or dies in their sleep or dies while they're unconscious, uh, those sort of situations, uh, 
how is that now? How does the state of mind of, is affected by that fact that they, that person won't have much mindfulness because they're asleep or unconscious? Um, and as Jan said, yes, of course, that's not the ideal or the the best way to die. Uh, the better way to die is with mindfulness, full mindfulness. But the problem is obviously at death. There's a lot of dukkha waiting there, and particularly with certain kinds of death and illness, the dukkha waiting is very extreme, very strong, and so that's the uh, the main. Uh, thing that the mind is aware of is just dukkha waiting and the waiting of at that time and without much clarity or insight or, or mindfulness it's just caught up in the dukkha waiting of the experience uh, which is not so good uh, without mindfulness the mind slips out of the body or separates from the body and it's kind of too late to do anything then but at the same time whenever one death is approaching there are always signs, physical, mental signs that do warn us of the uh, imminence of death, even if it's quite, you're very close to a sudden death experience, you know, your death is sudden, there will always be some uh, warning signs and so for, you know, for the practitioner that's, you're practicing so that you can take those warning signs and quickly establish mindfulness, say in the case of a stroke you have blood vessels bursting and pain and so on in your head uh, that could you know that's the warning sign for you quickly to establish mindfulness at that point and maintain that mindfulness till the moment you pass away and obviously certain experiences of death strokes and heart attacks can be fairly quick and the weight in our level that pain and discomfort is not so extreme so it's quite possible one could maintain mindfulness right through that experience at the moment of death. Um, but that's the challenge say, of, of the practitioner, is how much one can maintain mindfulness through Dukkha Vaitana. And for many people, you know, that, that they're overwhelmed by the Dukkha Vaitana, especially, and especially if they're given painkillers, different kinds of strong painkillers, that doesn't help either. So, oh, so, and the other was, we should also reflect then that um, death can come at any time. We really don't know. It's unpredictable. It could be you know, in the air, when we're in, on the ground, in the ocean. Any time, day and night, death can come to us. So then, of course, one has to be preparing for it all the time through the practice of mindfulness and heedfulness. Uh, this is how the Buddha taught us to practice. Uh, it's literally to be ready for that moment through our pr- training ourselves every day. Uh, we're always bringing the skill of developing mindfulness through our own weight in Akanda and, and our different experiences of physical mental phenomena. Uh, learning to establish mindfulness, whatever, whatever our experience, being, getting that skill that we can gather the mind together uh, using meditation techniques to focus on Uh, our mindfulness on a meditation object and use that, say, at the moment when extreme vajana comes up or even at the moment of death, we gather our mind together to to keep it in a wholesome state where it's non-attached.